Part 1. You will hear a woman talking on the phone to a campsite manager. First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 5. Hello, Lake Payne Campground. Can I help you? Oh, hi, yes. Um, I wonder if we could book a site on your campground. Sure. My computer's down at the moment, so I just need to get a form. Okay. How many nights would you like to stay for? Um, well, ideally, we'd like to stay for five. Five nights? Okay. So when are you planning to arrive? Well, we'll be travelling around the area from mid-July, and we think we'll be at the lake by about the 24th. Let's see. July's a busy time. We could probably fit you in, but to be honest, if you want five nights, it would be better to get here a day earlier. We've got a big group coming at the end of the month. OK, the 23rd's fine. We weren't sure, so... Great. Do you just want somewhere to park and pitch a tent, or do you have an RV? An RV? Yeah. You know, a recreational vehicle? A camper van. Oh, right. Yes, we're driving a van, so... Okay. That's fine. So, um, what name is it, please? It's Hepworth. That's H-E-P-W-O-R-T-H. Okay, thanks. I've heard that name before. Well, it's quite common in England, particularly in Yorkshire. That's where we're from. I was going to ask if you were in the UK. It's a really good line, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> yes. Would this be your contact number? Yes. It's 07968 355630. Great. Thanks. Do you want my home number as well? No. That's fine. OK. We supply a number of facilities. I don't know if you're familiar with the way campgrounds work here. It would be good if you could explain. Well, you're coming in the RV, so would you like to hook up to our electricity? Oh, yes, please. You can also attach your vehicle to the water taps here. I hope it's all easy to do. <laughs> yeah. You just plug into the electricity and switch on the water. The people who hire out the RVs will explain it all. OK. And what about wastewater? Sure. You can have a site with a sewer. Or I think you guys call it a drain. That's a bit extra. Not all campgrounds have that facility, you see. Fine, we'll have it. So, what's the total and... Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 6 to 10. Now listen and answer questions 6 to 10. OK. I've allocated you a site, so you need to note the code down. Right. I'll just get a pen. Most of our sites are coded using letters and numbers, EW or SEW. Uh-huh. So yours is one of the SEW ones, and it's number 47. Got that. That's the area that has all the requirements you need. Is it easy to find when you get there? What time will you be arriving? I'm not sure, but it could be quite late. OK. So the reception could be closed. We close at 6. Oh, dear. It's OK. I'll tell you where to go. As you come into the campground entrance, you'll see our office. Mm -hmm. Drive past the front door. There's another office next to ours. That's the business office. Yeah, and there's a pool behind that. OK. It will be good to have a swim. It's open till 8, so feel free to use it. Keep going past all those, to the end of the track. At the top, you'll come to a... At the very end, there's a laundry. OK. Turn left at the laundry, and you'll see your own site straight ahead of you. They're all clearly labelled. 
That sounds easy enough. Just before you hang up, um, we've had a few problems with campers, with um stuff left lying around. Oh. Well, it may be an oversight, but we do ask our visitors to take away all their litter. Of course, otherwise someone has to clear it up. That's right. Also in the morning, you know, we do have washrooms, and once the reception's open, you'll be able to get a key for the shower. Right. You can keep it while you're on the site, but could you return it when you leave? I'll make sure we get it back to you. Yeah, otherwise we don't have enough to go around. Okay. Well, thank you very much. See you soon. Yeah. Bye. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part two. Part two. You will hear someone talking on the radio about colours. You now have some time to look at questions 11 to 14. Now listen carefully and answer questions 11 to 14. Well, it's a colourful start to the day on DB Radio. Cathy, what have you got to tell us? Thanks, Brian. I thought I'd talk about two areas today where colour plays a huge role in our lives, and they are food and fashion. So let's start with food, and more specifically, food colouring. In many parts of the world today, people like the food they purchase to be the right colour. So if we buy tinned or canned vegetables, such as green peas, it's highly likely that the contents have been enhanced through the use of colouring agents. Peas are naturally green, you might say, but they may not be green all over, or they may not be the most pleasing shade of green. So a natural additive or two can quickly sort that out, just as it can the perfectly minty green ice cream that we buy our children. Children are a big market for food and are easily tempted by colour. Breakfast cereals, for instance, that come in various shades of brown, are often altered using caramel, a natural brown food colouring derived from caramelised sugar. This also gives the cereals a shiny, mouth-watering appeal, which is hugely tempting for consumers. In fact, natural food colouring goes back a long way. One of the oldest, or perhaps the most well-known natural food colours, is red, or cochineal, named after the insects used to make it. Aztec Indians created a crimson dye from the bodies of crushed beetles. Producing cochineal is very costly, so it was unpopular with consumers for some years. But health scares linking artificial red dyes to cancer have meant that more shoppers are buying cochineal again. Now, there's one food colour that manufacturers use with a certain amount of caution, and that's blue. Our ancestors believed that food this colour was dangerous. If you think about it, very few naturally occurring foods are blue, and there is little demand for the colouring. In fact, if you're trying to lose weight, experts suggest that you put your food on a blue plate. It's almost guaranteed to kill your appetite. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 15 to 20.
Now listen and answer questions 15 to 20. OK, let's look at another area where colour is a key issue. If you say you've bought something new to wear, often the first question people will ask is, what colour is it? Yet the answer doesn't necessarily indicate that the colour was your preferred choice. As consumers, we have to balance how we feel in certain colours with what is fashionable at the time. You think you've suddenly developed a desire to wear orange, whereas, in fact, the shops are full of it and you've ended up buying an orange shirt that may or may not suit you simply because it's this season's colour. Well, the interesting thing here is that colourists, as they're called in the business, have to look ahead and say what colour models will be wearing in fashion shows several years in advance. To get this right, they have to consider how long it will take to produce the cloth dyes, they have to set up deals with suppliers, and bear in mind the constant changes in consumer taste. So what may seem to be this season's colour has actually been agreed years before. So what do we think about the colours we wear? Like everything, our tastes alter with age. In general, though, we think that black makes people look and feel thinner, while red does the opposite. White goes with everything, whereas yellow is harder to match. And nothing alters the fact that there are certain colours that we never feel comfortable wearing. And finally, whether it's food or fashion, anyone in the business field knows that it isn't enough to get a product the right colour. Even the packaging has to be carefully designed in order to maximise sales. It's no good, for instance, wrapping an item in brown paper if you want it to stand out. Much better to go for eye-catching colours. Or, in fact, in today's world, green has become very popular because it promotes the view that the company cares about the environment. In addition to their products, businesses also have to think about the people who come up with the ideas. If you surround your workers with drab colours, they'll come up with equally dull ideas. This isn't rocket science. We used to associate red with creativity in business, but it turns out, according to a recent study, that blue is a much better stimulus for creative thought. So the colour's not all bad. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part three. Part 3. You will hear a student talking about her problems with a counsellor. Before you listen, you have 30 seconds to read questions 21 to 26. So, Rachel, how have things been going? All right, I suppose. Are you ready for your presentation tomorrow? I think so. Great. What about the rest of the study plan we made? Have you been sticking to it? Well, that's why I came back to you. I did manage to get everything done for my presentation, but now I'm way behind with my other assignments. And I'm starting to panic. You've got the 3,000-word essay for criminal law, haven't you? And one on taxation? That's right. What seems to be preventing you from doing them? My own indecision is one factor. You see, we were given two choices for the criminal law essay, and I seem to change my mind daily about which one to do. I remember in our last session that you said 
I might be using procrastination to obscure some other inadequacy, perhaps not understanding the legal topic as well as I ought to. If I get a low mark, I can just say, well, I did that essay in such a rush, instead of admitting that I don't have a grasp of the subject. Intellectually, I understand what you've told me, but I'm afraid it hasn't made a difference to my starting the essay. Another thing that's affecting me is the demands of other people. Like what? Take my flatmate, Teresa, who's a nursing student. We've been sharing a flat for over a year, and we used to get along really well. But recently, she's been pestering me to help her with her assignments. You might suggest your flatmate get help from her college with her studies. I've done that, and she claims she's been going to the Student Learning Centre on campus. Meantime, if I don't help her at home, she calls me selfish or arrogant or unfriendly and then starts sulking. The atmosphere in our place is poisonous. What can I do about my boss? Last week, I worked 12 hours overtime. I'm exhausted. I felt obliged to accept the work because right now he's making decisions about who to keep on over the summer. And if I turn down extra shifts, he may not consider me. I certainly can't afford to lose my summer job. Remember, Rachel, your goals and priorities. Is your long-term goal to work in a supermarket or to be a lawyer? Of course, to be a lawyer. I know I've got to concentrate on that. As I think I've said, I can see everything clearly when I'm here in the office with you, but I waver as soon as I leave. Before you listen to the rest of the conversation, you have 30 seconds to read questions 27 to 30. You wanted to talk about your ex-boyfriend, Dan. Yes, Dan. Hmm. I know we went through all this in the last session as well, but he's been bugging me again. What does he want? To get back together. Do you want that? Yes. No. I mean, I ended the relationship. Dan's a great person, and I'll always think of him fondly. But we somehow brought out the worst in each other. All right. Keep Dan at a distance while you focus on your studies. Politely tell him that you want to remain apart. Let's make another study plan now, with your starting work on your 3,000-word essay tomorrow. That's due on the 9th, isn't it? Yes, just ten days away. I can't possibly do it by then. Even if I settle on a topic, the reading list is as long as my arm. And I've another confession to make. I've barely attended a single tutorial for that course, so I don't even understand the basics. With the state I'm in, I won't be able to absorb any of the complex arguments let alone critique them. Really, my situation's awful. Do you think I could get an extension? Rachel, your situation is difficult, not awful. And all of these things we can solve. Remember, reduce contact with people who don't help you and reduce your hours at the supermarket. Focus on your essays and your future goal. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers.
Now turns to part four. Part four. You will hear a psychology lecture about rational emotive therapy, or RET. Read questions thirty-one to forty. Good afternoon. Last week we discussed why people seek therapy. This week we're going to look at one kind of psychotherapy called rational emotive therapy, or RET. But before we get started, I'd like to quote a first-century philosopher called Marcus Aurelius, whose words I think are apposite to this discussion. He wrote something like. The universe is about change. Life is what thinking makes it. R E T is also about accepting the world while changing thought patterns. R E T was created by an American, Albert Ellis, in the 1950s. The main aim of R E T is to develop healthy emotional responses to cope with unfortunate circumstances. Anger, anxiety, or depression is replaced with upset, followed by acceptance, then by moving on. Let's take the example of a person who is involved in a car accident. Of course, your physical injuries are your primary concern, and satisfactory medical assistance in hospital is critical. But how fast you heal after that assistance is not only determined by the kind of medical care you have received. But also by your attitude. You probably had no control over the accident, but you can control how you feel about it afterwards. Anxiety, guilt, and even rage at others involved are all mental states that you can overcome. Here's another scenario: Your sister borrowed some money from you a year or so ago and hasn't made any effort to give it back. A well-balanced person thinks, "Oh dear, never mind," but an unbalanced one says, "My sister should give me my money back. She mustn't do this to me, or she's always been so selfish. She never treats me well." Now, people, including your sister, are both good and bad, and they do change. Imagining how awful your circumstances are doesn't help. You're far more likely to get your money back if your sister knows you don't judge her and you avoid words like should, must, always, and never. One of Albert Ellis's fundamental beliefs was that too many people these days awfulize. Yes, he even coined the term to awfulize. He considered. That people make things seem awful that really aren't. They disable themselves through anxiety, rather than accepting the challenges there are in modern life. To introduce his ideas to the world, Ellis came up with the A B C scheme. In this, A stands for adversity, something out of the ordinary that causes difficulty. Ellis was convinced that when A struck. It was B, a person's beliefs, that often affected them more than A itself. This leads to C, or consequences. Some of these could be relatively minor, like headaches or skin disorders, but others could be serious and debilitating, like long-term mental illness. Ellis added D to his A B C scheme. This means. A person distinguishes between awfulizing and healthy beliefs. During this process of distinguishing, a person's mental worldview undergoes a significant change, and as a result, he or she makes a genuine recovery. Albert Ellis set up his practice in the cosseted world of New York City, where the majority of his patients could afford superior medical care. 
and probably hadn't really experienced any great trauma. So what if something really awful does happen? How would RET be effective with those sufferers? Quite a lot of research has been done on refugees from major conflicts. They appear to fall almost equally into two groups. One, the badly affected, and two, the largely unaffected. All the refugees lived through the same war, but they chose to be happy, or they chose to be sad. So, how does RET work? Initially, therapists and patients target specific problems and set daily and weekly goals. Exercises are connected to everyday life. There are links on my website to some of these if you're interested. As I mentioned earlier, replacing anger with upset is the first phase of treatment. Anger can be as threatening to the body as the original trauma. Confronting the very thing a patient is afraid of is another approach. If a person has a phobia of cars after an accident, he or she is put right back behind the wheel. Critics of RET say the treatment is too short and too unkind, and its rehabilitation rate of around 40% is not very high. Because it focuses on mental states in the present and it completely ignores a patient's past, detractors believe it fails to address underlying issues. Other more conventional methods of therapy explore the past in some detail. Nevertheless, Ellis and RET have reintroduced rationalist philosophical notions into everyday treatment. I'll leave it up to you to evaluate their success. That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Like